Good evening, everyone, or good morning if you're coming from another place or good afternoon. Today, we are so fortunate to have Venerable Nyaninda, who is joining us from Malaysia. Um, Venerable, he will be talking about a really important topic today, which is speaking about the core teachings of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths. So some information about Venerable. Venerable is a graduate in electrical engineering and computer science from Sydney University, Australia. So Venerable was staying here for a long time. And he just told me that it's been 20 years since he's come to Sydney. So I've invited him to come back again. I think it's time. And he received high ordination as a bhikkhu under Sadamas Rasi Sayadaw in 2004. He had received serious contemplative training under Payok Sayadaw in the Miami forest tradition. He had spent many years practicing in Miami, India, Nepal and Germany. Currently, he is the spiritual advisor of Buddhist Missionary Society of Malaysia, which is BMSM Youth Section and also the BMSM Kajang Annual Teen Teenage Camp. So I think today we also have some friends joining us from BMSM. So I welcome them to the session as well. So as always, we will have plenty of opportunities for all of us to learn the Dhamma from Venerable, as well as also Venerable has told me it's going to be an interactive session. So he's going to ask us some questions and he's also open to hearing from us if we have any questions. If you have any questions, just pop it into the chat and I'll facilitate the session. So Venerable, so pleased to have you here and I now hand over the floor to you to lead us in meditation. Okay. Um... I will guide you all through some simple meditation exercises. Um, all these exercises is mainly to strengthen our awareness. Okay, but the awareness is not the end goal. The end goal is to strengthen our awareness, the presence, so that we can be able to see the reality better, to be able to have insight better. Okay, so along these exercises, I will introduce different objects. The objects is not the important thing. The important thing is the presence, the awareness. Okay, so we will start first the posture. Um, although all these exercises can be done in any posture, whether you are sitting, walking, uh, lying down too, but it's easier to start with a good sitting posture. Okay, so for a good sitting posture, if you are sitting on the chair, try to keep both your sole of the feet flat on the ground, parallel to each other. If you are sitting on the floor or cushion, keep the two knees and your buttock, the three points on the cushion or on the chair, uh, on the cushion on the floor. Keep the back straight. Okay, even when you are walking, it's good to keep the back straight, but relax, comfortable. Okay, the hands you can put one on top of the other like this or the other way or on the knees, this way or the other way, as long as you are comfortable, okay? Then imagine there is a string tying your head up so that your head don't drop down. And finally, the eyes, you can close, half close or open. It's up to you, okay? But if you are sleepy, please open the eyes wide, okay? But if you are restless, it might help to close the eyes or half close, okay? We will start. Just... Bring your attention to your breath. Just know the breath as much as you can. As you breathe in, you know that you are breathing in. As you breathe out, you know that you are breathing out. Just know as much as you can. If there are wandering thoughts, don't try to push it away, but don't get lost in it. Just continue to know the breath as much as you can.
if the breath becomes subtler, don't make it gross. Just allow it to be. Now aware that the breath keep changing, it's impermanent. Sometimes the breath is long, sometimes the breath is short, sometimes it's shallow, sometimes it's deep. It never remains the same. Also, the breath is not fully satisfying as if we have, as in we have no full control over the breath. The breathing go on by itself. Finally, there is actually no person breathing. The breathing process just occur by itself. There is not a self in the breathing process. Now bring your attention to your heart, aware of your emotions, whatever emotions that you have. It could be happiness, sadness, and so on. Aware that emotions keep changing. It's not permanent. And also you are not your emotion. Whether it's happiness or sadness, you are not happiness, you are not the sadness and so on. Finally, aware that no matter what emotions that you have, at the background, there is always this calm and peace, this natural quietness, this childlike carefree innocence. Just stay in this natural childlike carefree innocence. for a short while.
be aware of your body. If you can be aware of your body, for those who have closed your eyes, can slowly open the eyes. Okay, before I go on, any questions on the meditation exercise? In the meditation exercise, I've also guided you all through actually the three characteristics of uh, life, which the another, which also is part of the core teaching of Buddha: uh, impermanence, anicca, unsatisfactoriness, dukkha, anatta, not self. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, if not, along the way, uh, I would prefer this to have a. Uh, more of an interactive session, not me preaching to you, but me sharing as in we are exploring the Dharma together. So please feel free to ask any questions, uh, but preferably related to what I'm sharing. Um, also preferably something practical. Okay, I'm not a scholar, so preferably something that is related to our daily life that you can put it into practice immediately. Okay. Um, Okay, so the key thing I want to, I want to set the uh, background for this sharing. I want to emphasize this, that the key thing for Buddha's teaching is about um, realization, okay, about transforming ourselves. The Americans would call it a transformative conversation. Okay, so um, I hope by the end of the session, you will have some realization or be able to see the world in a different way, which will help you in your daily life. Okay, so, um, okay, basically, to see the world in an entirely different perspective. That's what the whole Buddha's teaching is to allow us to see the world in a totally different perspective to solve all our life problems. Okay, I will start with the, uh, let me show you the slides. So, um, I would start by asking some questions, okay? So, how many of you think that Buddhist, the Buddha's teaching is a religion? Anyone thinks that the Buddha's, you can put the, uh, yeah, okay. Some people might think it's a religion, but... It has some religious aspect in it, but if you think of it as a religion, as in praying for some savior, then that's not the Buddha's teaching. Okay. How many people think it's a philosophy? Yeah, some people have put their hands up for religion and philosophy here. Okay. It is, it has an element of philosophy, but if you think it's just philosophy as in theory, then it's not quite right because the Buddha's teaching is very practical to be realized immediate now, not sometime later. Okay. Is it science? Someone's put their hands up for science? Yeah. The closest to me for the Buddha's teaching is science. Okay. A famous um, uh, Buddhist master, Chongsa Kense Rinpoche, mentioned that if he were to teach Buddha's teaching in the university, he will put it under faculty of science. For me, I will put it under faculty of engineering because I think it's more about solving life, engineering of life problems. Okay, how many think it's about morality? Yeah, we've had a few in here. Okay. If you think Buddhism is uh, the Buddha's teaching is just about morality, full stop, then you are wrong. Morality is a good foundation, definitely. Buddha's teaching is not about immoral, but it's not the end game. Morality is just the starting, and it cannot be in the driver's seat. So who thinks it's a part of living? <laughs> a lot more hands for that one, venerable. <laughs> okay. Some people think it's a art of living, okay? But it's to me, it's much more than that. It's not just an art of living because it allows us to solve all our problems in life, or without exception. I'm going to mention it later. How many things that it's all about compassion? 
one person have put their hand up for that. But also, Venerable, a lot of people have been saying that it looks like it's all of the above. <laughs> okay. Um, it's It has strong element of compassion and it's a good marketing aspect for Buddha's teaching, but it's also not the end game. Okay. So it has element of all the above correct, but it's more towards science. Okay. But not fully science because... Um, Science, traditional science, based a lot on something that you can verify experimentally. But Buddha's teaching is more than that because some things along the mind you can't, not so easy to verify using experiment. And also, the Buddha's teaching includes experimentation on the experimental, which science is moving close to because science then. Modern science already knows that the observer changes the experiment. It's called the observer effect, which is getting close to what the Buddha's taught. Uh, you will notice that I try not to use the word Buddhism because Buddhism gives you the idea that it's a religion. But the Buddha's teaching actually is to help us to solve our daily problems. He never intended to start a religion. Okay, next slide. Okay, so... What is the Four Noble Truth, the core teaching of Buddhism? Okay, before, um, before I start on the Four Teaching of uh, the about Four Noble Truth, I want to share a very uh, my favorite Zen story. Okay, because it will give you an idea about um, the Buddha, what Buddha's teaching is about. Because Buddha's teaching is not about trying to find salvation after life or trying to i'm not saying that's bad okay but the the key aim is about realization and solving your problem now at this moment okay not later not 100 years later not next life and so on so and this story i think a lot of you might have heard but um it's stress about solution not here and now so there's a very famous um uh, this is supposedly a story about a famous samurai uh, warrior who wanted to know what is heaven and hell. So he went up, he heard there's a famous Zen master up in the mountain. So he went up to the mountain and asked the Zen master this question. He says, can you please, the wise one, can you please tell me what is heaven and hell? I want to find the answer. And the Zen master looked at the samurai warrior and he looked at him and says, you idiot, pig brain, you will never be able to understand what is heaven and hell. You are too dumb. Your IQ is too low. And the samurai is extremely angry. You know, you never insult a samurai. He has like extreme, you know, he just fall in, go into extreme rage. And then he pull out his, his, uh, sam his uh, sword and about to strike off, to chop off the head of the uh, Zen master. And the Zen master just look at him calmly and says, you are now in hell. And this samurai warrior was totally elated that this Zen master could risk his life to let him experience hell here and now. Not next life, not next time, but immediate experience of hell here and now. Immediately he has bliss and he was totally happy. And the Zen master looked at him and says, you're in heaven now. So Buddha's teaching is about heaven and hell now, here, not in the next life. Okay, And when you change your perspective of life, you will actually change your experience of life from hell to heaven in one thought, like what the samurai warrior did. Hell and heaven is just one thought away. Okay, So the Four Noble Truth is... Um, very useful, not just to solve your life problem. It is very useful to solve all problems, your business problems, your engineering problems, whatever problems you have. Okay, so four parts. First, you've got to know what's the problem. That's very important. Okay, if you don't know the problem, you cannot solve the problem. Um, I just want to tell you my personal story. When I was... Uh, one time, this many years ago, when I was working, uh, I had a business trip to Swindon in UK. 
I drove with my colleague from Heathrow Airport all the way to Swindon, parked our car, switched off the engine, got out, and the car, the indicator on the dashboard was flashing and the alarm was on, okay? And the only thing that strikes our mind is, you know, the alarm is giving us problem, so we have to switch off the alarm. We tried very hard, but somehow we managed to switch off the alarm, went into the meeting room. Not long after that, we heard an announcement. Could someone with this car number please come and switch off the headlights? Okay, so the problem was not the alarm. The problem was the headlight wasn't switched off. That's why the alarm went off. <laughs> so we have to know what's the problem. Otherwise, we will try to solve the wrong thing as in switching off the alarm instead of switching off the headlight. Similarly, um, also many years ago, I heard there was a businessman who was doing very, uh, opened a restaurant, was doing extremely well. Many, the business was very good. A lot of customers, they even have to queue. But he didn't make any money. In the end, he has to close down the, the restaurants. And many years later, when he was eating with a friend nearby, the friend was telling him, you know, just around the corner, used to have a very good restaurants, lots of customers, but in the end, they have to close down. You know why? Because when I eat there, they were too busy. They didn't collect the money. So many customers left without paying. And finally, the owner who was sitting to this friend finally realized that why he lost the business. So knowing the problem is very important. In university, we're trained not to solve problem, but to find out what's the problem. So next thing is the cost. Once you know the problem, you need to find out what's the cost. Okay. And then the ending of the problem, whether you, the problem can be solved and what it means by ending the problem. And finally, the method. Okay. So in our case, our live problem is actually dukkha, which is translated in traditionally as suffering. I don't like that translation because dukkha covers a very wide scope. It includes um, even happiness. When we grasp on to happiness, that also gives us a feeling of unsatisfactoriness. So that includes is included in dukkha. So I would prefer to translate as unsatisfactoriness or insecurity. So that's the problem in our life. That's the only problem. All our problems comes down to this feeling of insecurity, this feeling of wanting to protect this self. Okay, so this is all our problem. And the cause, okay, let me go to the next slide. So all our problem comes from personalization of all our impersonal experience. Every experience we have is just a experience but we make it into my experience. Why did he do that to me? How come he didn't do that? He do this for me. Why did he insult me? All our problems come from I, me, mine. Okay. But it's not because we are bad or something. It's because we didn't see life properly. I will explain later. Okay. The insecurity of life is because we also think that there is a self that we need to protect. A, in, a self that don't exist, okay? When I say self, as in an independent, non-changing, permanent self, every one of us think that we have in, independent, non-changing, permanent self. We think that yesterday's Nyaninda and today's Nyaninda and tomorrow's Nyaninda is the same, but it's not. But it's also not, there is, it's also not nothing, Okay, don't get the idea it's nothing. It's, there are processes going on, but we turn it into a self. The cause is unaware or emotional reaction due to this personalization. Because we have this I, me, mind, so we react when someone says we are stupid or someone says that we are not good enough. The, the cause also can say, that is because of this dream of existence, that we think that there is a self that exists, but it doesn't. Okay, it's, it's an illusion. So the solution is the elimination of the unaware emotions or personalization or awakening from this dream of existence. If you wake up from the dream, everything is solved. Okay, 
So the method is the Noble Info Path, the journey towards awakening. So I have a question to ask you. If you are in a dream and you are chased by monsters in a dream and it's a very cruel monsters, how do you solve this? You wake up. Yeah. Actually, you 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 can't you can't actually, there's no real method or solution actually, because once you wake up, everything is solved. You don't have to solve the monsters that's chasing you. you this is the way. Uh, you have to wake up, not let it be. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't wake up, you will, you will be tortured by the monsters, as in, because when you have a nightmare, actually, your heart beats very fast and you sweat and all that, you actually has a terrible experience too. You cannot say it never happened. Yeah. You cannot say something in the dream happened, but you cannot say it doesn't happen. So um, the way to solve it is to wake up. So similarly, in our daily life, I will show, slowly show you that every experience that we have, no matter how tragic the experience is, what we feel, what we experience is a um is similar to the dream okay i'm not downplaying whatever tragic experience happened to you i'm it does happen but your experience of it is created by your thoughts so it's similar to a dream can i say something please yeah. okay go just, ahead sorry it just made me think of um another person that was talking to us on here a few months ago and he said um he was talking about that poem about um the 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 little song row 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 your boat gently down the stream um merrily 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 life is but a dream and he was saying treat life as if you're just going down a stream because life is a dream anyway why would you treat it as if it's any bigger is that relevant uh, I have to be very careful here, okay, because I have to emphasize that a lot of us, when we think dream, we think it's nothing, okay? If you think dream is nothing, then uh, no. Dream is not nothing because when you are in a nightmare, you really suffer. So, but it's also not something, okay? So the closest, I always give this example, and this is the example given by... Uh, Zhongsa King Zhe Rinpoche, is that everything you see is like a rainbow. It's there, but it's not really there because it's not solid. Because everything you experience is made up from your thoughts, so it's not a solid reality, but it's, you cannot say it's nothing. Okay, any other questions? Please do ask questions so that... Um, No, no, I'll, I will explain uh, further. Okay, so this is from the text, okay, in the first uh, discourse by the Buddha, the turning of the wheel of Dharma, Buddha defined what is Dukkha, okay, which is the first noble truth. So Dukkha is defined as birth, sickness, old age, and death, okay. Actually, all this doesn't have to be suffering if you don't personalize them, okay? Normally, we personalize them. That's why we suffer. But actually, sickness is not a good or a bad thing. Sickness actually is an indicator that it, it tells you that something is wrong with your body and you have to do something. Pain also is not something which is bad. If you don't have pain, like the people who are suffering from leprosy, they have big problems. They wish they have pain. I don't, because they have no pain, they have no sensitivity, they lost their limbs because they can't feel it. They, when they hit something, they can't feel it. So all this, which we think is a bad thing, is because we personalize this and because our thought make it as bad. Okay, next slide. Being with people we don't like, separation from people we like, all this is uh, the definition of dukkha. And again, all this happens because we personalize things. People we don't like or people we like, it's very subjective. 
Today, we might like this person. Tomorrow, because our thought changes, we, we might change our view of them. Today, we might love this person. Tomorrow, we might not. Okay, so it's all due again to our thoughts. Not getting what one wants. Again, this is because of our personalization of things. What you want today, tomorrow you might not want. Okay, I'm not sure about in Australia, but in Asian countries, especially in Malaysia, quite a lot of parents, they have this dream of building a big house with their children and grandchildren to stay in. By the time the house is already built, their children migrated to overseas, a lot to Australia, and uh, left with the couple, old couple staying in a huge house, and they realize that's not what they want. Okay, so what we want changes, but we think what we want remains the same forever. That's why we, we have to get what we want, otherwise we, we are not happy. So when we personalize it like this, that's where our pain and suffering comes from. Okay, the last part is the most important. Buddha summarized it in Sankitena Pachut Padana Kanda Dukkha, which traditionally is translated as the five grasping or clinging aggregates which is the five processes that runs us, is suffering. I don't like this translation um, because it gives you the idea that we are bad, as in, you know, we hold on to things, that's why you suffer. I prefer the uh, translation given by Mandi Punyaji, which is, um, in short, the personalization of the five processes is dukkha. Because we personalize, the five processes, in short, is your feeling, uh, your the forms that you see, your feeling of them, your perception of them, your stories about them, and your awareness of them. So basically, because we personalize things around us, personalize all phenomena, personalize all relationship, that's why we have to cut, which I prefer to translate as unsatisfactoriness. Okay, any questions so far? There's a question here. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so my question is, does that mean personalization is bad? So from all what we're saying, it's all come down to the fact that we keep personalizing. Person yeah. So yeah. Is pers personalization is, is bad? Is some things that we should avoid? Okay. Mm. Okay, good question. Okay. I prefer not to give prescription. I prefer to give you description and you make the decision. Okay. Like for example, if I tell you, if let's say you are doing this and I tell you that, hey, you are slapping your own cheeks, your own face, you will know what to do. I don't have to tell you, please don't slap your cheeks. So it has to come from realization. If you keep seeing that all your pain comes not from outside, not from what's happening to you. It comes from your thoughts about what's happening to you that's caused you suffering. Then you won't continue creating thoughts that cause you suffering. But I'm not asking you to stop the thoughts. There's a big difference. It looks the same, but it's a big difference. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Then okay. I have a question, if it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, but before, I just want to stress this because um, in the modern society, in my, my generation, um, although I'm not that old, but in my generation, we can accept people telling us you should not do this, you should do this. But in the current society, people don't like, even myself, I don't like to be told, you should do this, you should not do this. So to me, I love Buddha's teaching. To me, although it gives you some methods to do things, but it's more about description of how life works and it's up to you to make your decision. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next question. Sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you, Venerable. Um, the question is this. Say that we enjoy nature and scenery, how do we not personalize this? But does it mean enjoying it makes it personal? No. Okay, good question. Okay. If you can see everything as rainbow, okay, no one would 
claim the rainbow, take it home and put it and guard it and put it in the safe. That's what I mean by personalizing. You make it my rainbow. Okay. If you can see everyone, everything as rainbow, every phenomena, including your loved ones at rainbow, you still enjoy them, but you don't have to even let go of them. Because in Buddhism, we always talk about like letting go, which I don't really like because if it's something that I like, how do you ask me to let go? But if I realize that there's nothing to hold on to because everything is just like rainbow, there's nothing solid to hold on to, then there's nothing to let go. So in terms of beautiful sceneries, in terms of uh, forests and all that, you can't hold on to them. You don't even hold on to a flower because you know it's not going to remain the same. So if there's nothing to hold on, there's nothing to let go, there's nothing to personalize. There's only something to personalize if you think that it's going to be remaining the same forever. Okay. Um, can we have another question? Good, good. Please go ahead. Wonderful. So someone has asked, thank you for the very engaging and insightful discussion so far. While unsatisfactoriness is indeed an example of dukkha, aren't we trivializing the term dukkha by just calling it unsatisfactoriness? There are real sufferings in the world, such as calamities, famine, torture, war, etc. Oh, okay, good. When I say unsatisfactoriness, it covers permine war and all that because those are unsatisfying to us. It's just a degree. So I don't want to exclude the minor part. The those calamity, uh, permanent diseases, those we already know that those are. Dukkha. All of us knows, but we don't. Most of us don't know that even unsatisfactoriness, feeling that something is not so right with my life, that's also dukkha. Okay, good question. Thank you, Venerable. That's all the questions about this topic for now. We'll let you continue, okay. otherwise we may not get to the fourth noble truth. <laughs> okay, okay, it's okay. Um, as long as you have some relax. So dukkha, it's because of I, me, mine. Okay. And because you deal with people, not deal with action. If you change the way you work in your life, if you deal with action, not deal with people, you will realize that your life will immediately change, transform. Okay, not just change for the better, your life will totally transform. But when I say that all our dukkha comes from I, me, mine, don't just do it superficially. I know people who just change by changing their language. Then they will start saying, Nyaninda, give oh. this to me, pass this to Nyaninda. They avoid trying to avoid using I, me, mine. That doesn't work. Okay. Okay, next. Okay, so when we see something, this is science um, from Rick Maddock, professor of psychiatry and behavioral science. One neuron of information comes through the eyes. Actually, we don't even see any images when we see something. It's only light information of light coming through our eye and then 10 neurons of information internally from our opinion background from the past merged with this one neuron of information and that's how we process whatever information we see hear smell and so on which means we actually don't see what's out there we see what we think out it's step out what is out there and what we think is out there is totally biased by our opinion, background, by our beliefs and so on. So my point I want to stress is we believe, we hold on, we fight so much to protect our opinion, belief and what we see, but what we see is actually very far from the ultimate reality. In fact, we never see here or experience the ultimate reality. We only see here, smell, what our thought tells us. Okay, this is a very important point. Okay, now if you were to jump, okay, quite often human has this problem. We would jump to therefore, so Bante says this, therefore Bante asks us to think positive, then you have got me wrong. I'm not asking you to think positive, although thinking positive is good. Whether it's positive thinking or negative thinking, it's all made up. 
because you don't experience the ultimate reality. You experience what you think of the ultimate, of what is out there in the world. Okay, this is not bad news. This is good news because you cannot control what is happening in the world. You cannot control your husband. You cannot control your wife. You cannot control your kids. Surprisingly, many people come to monks and ask, you know, can you help me change my wife, change my husband and so on, change my kids? You can't. But the good news is your experience of your husband's wife and kids don't come from them. It comes from your thinking of them. So now you have a choice of change within you. Very good news. You cannot change your boss or so, but you don't have to because your experience of your boss don't come from your boss. It comes from your thinking of the boss or thinking of what the boss do or don't do, say or don't say. Okay, any questions on this? If you can really realize this, even a small realization, I guarantee you, your life will immediately transform because you operate in a totally new world. Any questions? I have a okay. question. Okay, go ahead. Um, I notice a lot these days, um, especially with misinformation going around so severely. I also notice because of um, on social media a lot, people will see something going wrong in the world and then they come up like with this whole new theory, like they'll see a few bad things happen in one area and they've grown into like this dark conspiracy that's happening in the whole universe with, and they just make it very, very convoluted. Um, and then you start hearing like friends and people around you kind of saying the same thing as things they see online. Um, should we just like leave these people with their beliefs? Is there any way to help them? Is there anything to say or should we just leave them? We should, Buddhism emph emphasize on changing ourselves first. Okay. If you change, you manage to change yourself, you will influence the, all the people around you. By your by yourself changing because you have totally different aura, totally different perspective in life, totally different energy and so on. So change ourselves first by by not by just changing the way you look at life. If you can really realize that whatever you experience is thought created is made up, then you wouldn't made up a terrible world for you to live in. Okay, any questions? Okay, if not, I'll, con I'll continue. So, whatever circumstances, people and things that we encounter, we actually don't experience them directly. It has to be filtered through our thoughts based on our background, belief, biases, and so on. And that is what we experience. So we actually, every single moment in life, without exception, we are experiencing our thoughts, not the, the world, the circumstances, the people and the things. Okay. So when you see, I like this because um, if you see me, if you come into a room where you see me sitting on the table with nothing on it, you might think that it's a very cute, interesting chair. But if there's something put on the table, then you will immediately look at it as a table. Yeah. So it's our bias, our preconditioning that we already limit things. This is another problem with human. We have actually unlimited potential to do things, but we always limit whatever we see here based on our memory. So our memory is very limited. It's like a small hard disk in a, a computer. But actually, we have access to all the information in the internet. Because according to science, everything is in a, tech, in a quantum entanglement. But because of our mind limited 
in processing everything based on our memory, we are limiting ourselves. So again, this is an incentive not to limit or personalize our experience. I love this because uh, when I say rate, your rate and my rate and the Buddha's rate can be very different. But yet, we think whatever we say is like everyone will understand the same. No, we all, our experience, what we experience is our thought and no other person will experience the same way as we do. Okay, so a lot of misunderstanding comes from this. When I say rate, you thought a different rate and I thought a different rate. Okay, so everything that we see is made up from all our information from the past. It's like quotes. So we do not see things as they are. We see them as we are. Everything we see is a reflection of our thoughts, our mind, not what is out there. This is another example that I like. We love watching sunrise or sunset, but actually the sun never rises, never set. It's the earth that's rotating. But it doesn't mean we cannot, I still enjoy sunrise and sunset, although I know the sun never rises, never set. It's an illusion. So illusion is not a problem. Illusion actually is um, wonderful. Okay, maybe not for people my generation, but kids now nowadays understand illusion better because we live in a virtual reality world. Games, virtual reality games is billion dollar industry. Movies, billion dollar industry. Animation, billion dollar industry. All are illusion. Our life actually is an illusion in a sense because it's all made up by our thoughts. Similar, but it's. I want to keep emphasizing it's not nothing, okay? Illusion is everything, it's not nothing. Um, okay, next slide. So if someone say you are stupid and you become angry, what is the main cause of your anger? It hurt your ego. Uh, then you are blaming yourself, okay? What happens is when someone say you are stupid, next time, Okay, when you get angry because someone say you're stupid or do or don't do, look at your thoughts. You will definitely have thoughts like this. Why did he say I'm stupid? How come he insult me? How can he do this to me? It's this chain of thoughts that make you angry. If you don't make effort to sustain this chain of thought, you cannot continue being angry. Absolutely. I like to repeat this because it's very important because a lot of this, us, including Buddhists, we think that when we are angry, we have to make effort to stop the anger. Actually not true. If you don't make effort to continue maintaining your angry thoughts, you cannot maintain your anger. It takes a lot of effort to maintain anger or any other negative emotion. So this is another paradigm shift for you. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm asking you, I'm inviting you, not asking, inviting you to the next time when you have any fear, anger, any negative emotions, okay? Actually, positive emotions is the same, but easier to see from negative emotions. Don't get upset that you're upset. Don't get angry that you're angry. Be happy that now you have an opportunity to see and realize the Dharma when you're angry or sad or fearful because you can explore that your anger, your fear comes from your angry thought, fearful thought, and so on. Okay, you don't have to analyze the thoughts. Just see that when the thoughts change, the emotion change, they come together. Okay, if you can, cannot do that, then you need a bit of um, calming of the mind. But the best is if you can see through this directly. Any questions on this? This is an important point. We have a question in the audience here, Venerable. Um, okay. I totally agree with what you say, um, and I do practice it in my daily life, but sometimes I feel I'm not facing the problem. I actually like kind of try to stop my mind thinking about it. Of course, that will stop me from suffering, 
like from angers and stuff. But at some point in time, I, I, I'll think about that again, about someone say something about me, that kind of suffering coming back. <laughs> so like it's not like resolving completely, but rather than sometimes I feel like I'm running away from. from okay. Yeah. Okay, before before I answer your question, there's something that uh, I, I don't want to miss out, okay? Is that when I say um, that your anger, your negative emotions come from your thinking, it doesn't mean that you don't solve the problem at, at hand, okay? So let's say your boss says something and then you get angry. It doesn't mean that you continue to work for the boss. It might mean that you might want to leave the boss and so on. But when you are not angry, when you are not fearful, actually your mind, when your mind is settled, our intuition will tell us the best action to do. Okay? So when you're not lost in your thoughts, not lost in your emotion, when the mind is settled back to its natural calm state, you have all the wisdom to do the best thing you can. Okay? So I'm not saying don't solve the problems. Okay? Now back to the sound that question. You later on that thought of anger come back again, thinking of what someone say uh, do is because you still think that your anger comes from him. You have not fully realized that the anger doesn't come from him. I'm not ask, I'm not saying that that person didn't do anything. I'm saying that your anger comes from your thinking of what he do or didn't do. If you don't have this thought which is created by you yourself, that, that anger cannot continue. But somehow subconsciously in you and a lot of people, okay, not just you, you is that we think that our anger comes from he, what he say or don't say. So I am helpless. So you have to explore this and realize this. Buddhism is about realization, about seeing. If you can see that every time when you are angry, you are doing this, you will then ask me, uh, Bante, Venerable, how, how do I make, sh uh, make sure my cheeks is not painful? You will immediately stop. Because now you don't see that you are creating angry thoughts to make yourself angry so that your heart is painful. You can't see that yet. So you have to keep exploring. Okay. Uh, one more question. One more yeah. question, Venerable, from yeah, the audience. Because uh, sometimes uh, okay. incident has happened few years back, and you recall, and still you can become angry. <laughs> it's long time has passed. Yeah, because you still think that that person make you angry. Okay, this is a good question. Do you realize that when you think back something that someone do two years ago? you are creating a new version of what the person did two years ago. What the person did two years ago is gone. Now you are creating a new experience and you are making yourself suffer because of this creation. And I call it version two of what you experience. Because when you create from memory, you are not creating exact, you are adding in new pepper and salt into that experience. You get what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Yes. So this is incentive that you don't have to recollect your past to torture yourself. You recollect your past is actually recreation, a new story of the past. Okay, any other questions? Not for now. Thank you, Venerable. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, next slide. Oops. So I keep stressing this because to me, if you really realize this, your world will definitely change. Okay. We never ever experience the world that we live in, which is not bad news, it's good news, okay, because you cannot control the world that we live in. We only experience the thinking of the world we live in. This, I must admit, we don't have full control, but at least we have a choice. 
you don't have full control over your thoughts. What thoughts creep up now, you don't have full thought, full control, but you can choose whether you want to continue this line of thoughts or not. Okay. So now the four noble truths can be seen in one moment all together. If you're aware of anger or fear, you will see the impermanent nature of anger, the source of anger, which is angry thoughts, and the anger which cease by itself, if not sustained. I just mentioned the process. In order for you to have the anger maintained, you need to maintain angry thoughts. Okay? All in one moment, this is the complete path of the Four Noble Truth. The same goes with all emotions. This is the nobility of the truth. It's very noble because the problem, the cause, the solution, and the method is all done at the same time. It's like you are being chased by monsters, terrible monsters in a dream. Immediately you awake, it's off. Because the problem is the dream. The cause is the dream. The solution is waking up from the dream. And the method is the tree above, which is seeing it's a dream. So similarly in our daily life, whatever we experience is similar to a dream because it's all made up by your thoughts. Made up doesn't mean nothing, okay? Because it's like a virtual reality. And all our emotions also, it's not permanent. It's not solid. We always think it's solid. It keeps changing if you don't maintain it. Okay. Next slide is similar. Let me change. Aware of the emotional reaction, you will see the thoughts or the dreams behind the emotional reaction. And you are making effort to sustain the emotions and making effort, like making effort to slap yourself. Realizing this, you will automatically not continue to create the emotion or in one moment, like seeing a dream leading to waking up from a dream. Com this is a complete path of the four noble truth. Again, this is the nobility of the truth. Okay, I last time I always wonder why if you just translate first noble truth as everything is suffering, then that's, there's no nobility in it. It's very noble because it's a virtual reality. And we are very blessed because we can't use this terminology 100, 200 years ago. But now, because we live in the era of virtual reality, we can use a lot of words to describe the profound teaching of the Buddha. Okay, I always use this example because uh, to me, every time when we get angry, I'm not saying you are bad or you are wrong. I'm just saying that every time when you get angry, you get upset, you get depressed, actually you are slapping yourself. And, when you, and you don't know, so don't blame yourself. You didn't know that you're slapping yourself, but the minute you know you're slapping, you're slapping yourself, you know that you don't have to. But if you want, you can continue. But you can't continue too long. Okay? Because some people are maybe a bit, a bit sadistic towards themselves. They want to continue. But it's not a problem. Once you know what's the source of your problem, then there's no problem. There's nothing to fear. But now you and me, most of us, think that all our emotions is due from outside. And we are helpless. We cannot control the world. So we suffer. But once you realize this, you are liberated immediately. You have freedom because your life is not a slave or subjected to the world. Not subjected to control by the world. Okay, any questions on this? Yes, Ben, well, we have a question from the audience. Oh, good. Yeah, so I totally agree with you and what you say is exactly what I'm always kind of experiencing. But what I also realize is sometimes our body, our chemistry in the body got addicted to the suffering. So it keeps bringing back the things that even though I'm aware that I shouldn't, you know, having that thought or something like that, but I, I have a feeling that the body just got addicted to, to, to that kind of negative feeling. So okay. every day, 
that okay. children arise, I are totally aware of it. And I know that it doesn't have to be like that. But sometimes I feel like I, I don't know how to get rid of it, even though I'm totally aware of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the problem is just now you use the word, you. I feel that um, I shouldn't do this. That is um, not what you should do because it's not about should or should not. It's about how deep your realization is. Okay, if we tell ourselves we should not be angry, then you haven't seen that the anger comes from your own self. Let's say I'm doing this. I don't have to tell myself I shouldn't slap myself. It comes automatically. When you see it, when you realize it, it comes automatically. So you have to keep exploring and keep seeing. But before you reach there, some prescription helps, okay? As in calming the mind, do more loving kindness meditation, make the mind less stressful, less tense. All these are helpful with the aim of helping you see that all your experiences come from your thoughts, not from outside. I, I hope it's help helpful. Yeah, it does. Thanks a lot. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. I, I understand what you mean. Because of our habit, um, we tend to struggle sometimes. But again, habit is a thought. Heaven and hell is just one thought away. Yeah. But if you have this strong idea that I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying that if you have this strong idea that because of my the chemistry in the body, because of my habit, so I have a struggle to change, then that's the reality also. Because your thoughts create your reality. Mm. If you think you cannot, you cannot. <laughs> okay. Good questions. I, I like this crowd. <laughs> Any other questions? Not for now, Venerable. There's okay, I'll topic, go ahead. But there's um, different topics, so we'll wait for the Q&A. Okay, I like this. Okay, um, you were asked, okay, Bante, what about my body? Okay, definitely my experience of my body is really my experience of my body. It's not my thinking of my body. It is. So I will do experiment. Find an uncomfortable part of your body. Let's say your leg, you know, those who are sitting on the cushion too long, maybe you feel your leg uncomfortable. Try this, okay? Put your attention on your leg. Let's say if your hand then is the same, okay? Tell yourself, my leg very painful, maybe it's going to break. Or tell yourself that there is a sharp sensation on the leg. Not my leg, the leg. Very big difference. Okay, so even your experience of your body is not the experience of the body. You are experiencing your thinking of the body. Okay, um, I wouldn't show you, I, I will not show you a video, but you can look in uh, YouTube. If you type in fake hand, they did an experiment where they put a fake hand in between, you know, on your shoulders and cover the real hand. They can make you think that the fake hand is yours. They put an ice on the fake hand and the person actually scream, but feel that's too cold. When they put it on the real hand because it's covered, they can't feel it. Of course, they did certain things to make you sensitize, think, to make you think that the fake hand is yours by using, just very simple, by using two feather, slowly rubbing the fake hand that you can see, making you think that the fake hand is yours. So even your feeling of your body is your thinking of the feeling of the body. You don't feel your body. You feel your thinking of the body. And this is good news also. Especially uh, people who are getting older and older. Young people might not feel it that much. We have pain here and there and so on, the back and so on. The degree of pain doesn't depend on what is happening on the body. It depends on what's happening in your mind. Okay, again, I want to stress that I'm not asking you to think positive. Otherwise, 
you would think that I have to think positive to change the world outside so that the, I can feel happy with the world outside. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that whatever you feel doesn't come from outside, including your body. It comes from your thought and you don't have to continue with thoughts that create pain and suffering to you. You can try all this magic. I call it miracle at home. It's simple things, but it's very practical and helpful and it's a very needed miracle in our life. Any questions on this exercise? Please, those who didn't do it, uh, try to do it at home. Venerable, it's, sorry? No, no, sorry. Please continue. Yeah. Any yeah. questions on this? Okay. Yeah. We have some questions from the audience. I think David had his hand up. So my first one is just by looking at that one you've got there, like I'm sitting there with my legs crossed. If I think to myself, my leg, my leg very painful. I want to move the leg straight away. If I sit there and just sort of meditate now, thinking on that one, I was thinking of it as in there's a sharp sensation on my leg. It's realizing that this leg's a bit sore because the other leg's on top. So it's funny just by not like, taking the mile or not personalizing it, it makes you not want to move your leg so much. But as soon as you personalize it, you'll, you almost have to move that leg straight away. What Thank you. Vulnerable to just to bring in that up when you think about it, it actually works. And yeah, it's funny the way that it works just by viewing it, mm. it changes what you want to do about it. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Okay, okay, I want to stress that I'm not saying that don't see a doctor if you have real pain in the body. Mm. Okay, this is to help us cope with whatever that's happening in the body, it doesn't mean that we don't treat it. Okay, and Please don't treat pain as the enemy. Since you're on this topic, pain actually is, you can say, uh, a messenger from heaven because it's trying to tell us something is wrong. That's why, so that you can fix it. So unfortunately, in the modern world, every time we have pain, we try to use painkiller to reduce the pain, to get rid of the pain. It's like me, with an example, trying to switch off the alarm and not switching off the headlights because the pain is telling you something is wrong in the body. The alarm is in my car, is in the dashboard, is trying to tell me that the headlights is not switched off. Okay. And you find it very, very interestingly, if your mind is calm enough to accept pain, not fight with pain as enemy, it doesn't affect you that much. That sensation, if you don't call it pain, is still there, it comes and goes, because it's impermanent, it comes and go. It doesn't affect you. It, it, it just comes and goes. I've tried it with um, very painful frozen shoulders. When I try to accept it, like I just tell it, no, frozen shoulder, fro frozen shoulder, I allow you to be here forever, to be my friend. I won't fight with you. I won't be an enemy with you. Surprisingly, it doesn't affect me anymore. Of course, I still go and see a, a doctor and get treatment, but it's a very good way to, um, I would say, cope with pain. Okay, any other questions? Yes, we have a question from the audience here as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you, Venerable. You mentioned this point about changing a perspective where you're witnessing the pain. Um, can you... Um, perhaps elaborate more about this tendency in us to also ask the question why sometimes when some pain arises and more to do with people relationships where this tendency exists where we go like why did this happen and we try to analyze it and we try to you know kind of I'm trying to understand its source and sometimes it yields like clear answers and sometimes it creates con more confusion, I find. Okay. Actually, it always creates more confusion. It doesn't really give you answers because all your thoughts are all made up stories. It's only when you are not lost in thoughts, you have access to all the information in the world, you will know what to do best. So, but the problem is we like to analyze your right. 
we think that by using this small, tiny computer, we can solve the problems. But your thoughts are creating more and more layers of illusion. So you have to, um, one way is realize that what you experience is not what's happening there. What you experience is a thought-created world. Then you don't believe this thought so much. The thoughts are like um advisor to this, a consultant to this CEO, but always give the wrong advice. But now you're trusting the consultant or the advisor 100%. That's where our problems come from. Could you repeat the last bit? I, I failed to grasp the last bit you mentioned. Yeah, yeah we, the problem with us is we treat our thought as a very good consultant or advisor. Right. So we, we follow the advice of the thoughts. Yeah. But all thoughts are biases made up. All may, are made up. None of the thoughts are the reality. Mm. So what we should do is set the thoughts. Okay, When you're not lost in thoughts, you actually are, we are quite brilliant to solve problems. Mm. We have the intuition to solve problems. Okay, But I want to warn you, I'm not asking you to stop the thoughts. I'm asking you to see the bad effect of the thoughts that means if you can see that you are slapping yourself, you automatically stop. Thank you. Okay. Please slowly digest this. Okay. Any other questions on this? They are valuable. Thank you. Okay. Please, whatever I've shared with you so far, please explore them. Um, actually, Whatever I've shared with you so far is a lot already, and it could, it's not could, it will definitely enough to transform your life. Okay, but uh, some more to one more experiment. Okay, so which you, before you move on, there's one more question on this topic. Are we having new thoughts listening to the Dhamma here? Are we having new thoughts? Yes, we are keep creating thoughts, but we are also changing our perspective on how we see things. Okay, whatever, at least you have the right perspective, but whatever perspective you see is not the reality. At least we can use a better perspective for now. Okay, the, you can only see the ultimate reality. Maybe we become an Arahant or the Buddha. For you and me, at least we, if we realize that all our perspectives are all made up, uh, we don't get trapped in our perspective. That's good enough. Because all our problems come from our how we see life, how we see that people are maybe bullying us, or people are insulting us, and so on. Okay, but I'm not asking you not to do anything. I always stress that Buddhists are not doormat for people to step on. But when your mind is not lost in your emotion and thoughts, you are actually brilliant in solving whatever problems you are facing. If you have enough money, we know how to make money if you are not lost in the thoughts. If you have problems with relationship, when you're not lost in the thoughts, you know what to say or not say to solve whatever relationship we have. So I'm just telling you that I'm describing how we are, how we are, we are actually, um, our problem is ourselves, our own thoughts. Okay, any questions? Not on this topic at the moment. Okay. So next experiment, it's similar. Okay. So think of something or someone that make you angry. If you can't, there are some people actually tell me, no, I can't think of anything that make me angry. Then maybe, you know, it's good because you are saying, I always can think of something that make me angry, but never mind. Then you think of something that make you fearful. Okay. Then feel the part of your body that makes you angry or fearful. Okay. Okay, we can do it now. Okay, so think of something that makes you angry. If you can't, then fearful. Then shift your attention to the part of the body that feel that anger or fear. For me, if I'm angry, it will be the heart very painful. Okay. Then if you can feel that part of the body with that emotion, don't continue to think of that angry thought or fearful thoughts. What happened to the feeling on the body? It stops straight away. It stops straight away because you are not making effort 
to continue with angry thoughts, so it cannot continue, so the anger cannot continue. For some people, it might take a while to stop. Okay, so this is because two things. First is you shift your attention from thoughts to the body. So you, you, can't, you, don't, you can't continue making angry thoughts because your attention is not on the mind, it's on the body. So, and also, because you cannot make, continue making angry thoughts, the, basically, okay, one thing, because you can't continue making angry thoughts, your, your angry feeling finishes, stop. So you don't need to make effort to stop anger or fear and so on. Making effort to stop will suppress it. But of course, if you are so angry that you're going to kill someone, so uh, please suppress it. We don't want to see you in jail. But preferably, if you could use wisdom, Buddhism is very big on wisdom and realization. The best is the next time when you're angry, upset, whatever, depressed, try to see that if, try to see that it's your own thoughts that created it. If you can't, don't worry, just don't continue with whatever thoughts you have, okay? Because trying to see, sometimes you get lost in the thoughts content. The content is not important. It's the type of thoughts. But if you tendency to get lost in the thoughts, then just don't need to even analyze the thoughts. Just know that you are on the wrong type of thoughts. Just change the thoughts if, if you can, okay? Uh, if you no, just change the thoughts. If you can't, just settle down. Change to positive thoughts. Otherwise, if you're fast enough, it, it will solve because you won't continue slapping yourself. Okay. Any questions? Yes, one question here. Okay. Uh, uh, venerable, the uh, this automatic uh, train of thoughts that arise that you just described that that causes this dukkha, where does this arise from? Is it because of some actions that we have done in the past or some incorrect thoughts that we have that have created this pattern of thoughts? Where does it come from? It comes from our past, yes, from our conditioning from the past of this life and past lives. But it's not important where does it come from. All you got to know is we don't have to continue with whatever thoughts that come up in our mind. Okay. You cannot try to stop thoughts. Of course, when you go higher level, arhats, buddhas, they can do that. But for you and me, don't be so ambitious as in try to stop thoughts. Just try to see that whatever thoughts you have, they are creating an illusory reality that you live in. Because you keep, if you keep seeing this, then you don't believe your thoughts so much. And because you don't believe your thoughts so much, then you have less thoughts. It has to go along this line through wisdom. If you try to stop thoughts by force, more thoughts will come. It's like trying to not think, not think, then you think more. <laughs> mm, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Very good questions. I just want to add something. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add. So I totally agree with you and I think this is something that I, I heard from one of the guy on YouTube, his name is Joe Dispenza. So he oh, okay. yeah, I know Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza. He wrote the book on placebo. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So, go with that. So, so what you're saying is exactly what he's saying. So one of the very, I would say something very stupid is that our body could not distinguish between the reality and the mind. And the thought. Correct. So it reacts based on the thought. So <laughs> you get me. So if you, if right. you imagine about something, it, it caused the reaction, but actually it's not what really happening. Correct, correct. So this, this is kind of like yeah. the problem. So our body could not distinguish between the reality that something real and something it just happened in my, our mind, something happened in our thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the comment. So, Venerable, we do have some general questions for the Q and A. Um, okay. Whenever it's a convenient, I can ask those questions. But did you have any further slides for the presentation? I have a lot more slides, but I don't have to go through all the slides. No, my my aim is to uh, hopefully, no, hopefully, uh, 
some people have realizations, but it's not to finish all the slides. Oh, okay. if we can always continue. Well, okay, anyway. Right, Venerable, um, someone on the chat has said that this session is so interesting and we need a part okay. two. So I'm, maybe part two for the rest of your slides. I'll totally. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, general questions you have? Yes. So the first question is this. How can we successfully challenge traumatic experiences with strong neuropathways? Um, so those who have traumatic experiences and perhaps mm -hmm. already created some strong neuropathways in a particular direction, how can we challenge or change that? Actually, it's... A change in traumatic experience is just a thought away, okay? Um, it's just a change of thought. When you have this idea, like just now the gentleman, that it's ingrained in my body chemistry and I can't change it, then it's a thought also. Then you can't change it, okay? I, I want to share um, this, this, this story, maybe a bit traumatic, so just be, just be uh, forewarned, okay? Um, this is a, a real story by uh, uh, some people might have heard of this guy called Michael Neal. He's a very famous transformative coach in America. I follow him a lot. Um, and he said many years ago, he invited a spiritual leader called Brian Katie, which some of you might be familiar also. Uh, and they actually invited people with traumatic experiences to share, to come live on radio. There was a radio show and get Brian Katie to lead them to see that they don't have to relieve that traumatic experience. It doesn't mean that traumatic experience is not real. That means the traumatic experience is, is there. We are, not, we are not trivializing it, but we don't have to recreate this traumatic experience and suffer. So actually they found an extreme case of a lady who, when she was in the teen, she was kidnapped and put in the cage and let out to rape only for maybe 10 years of her life. She has extreme traumatic experience. She was totally depressed, never have any happy or experience at all. Until the time when she was brought onto this radio show with uh, Brian Katie. Of course, Brian Katie is quite skillful. But basically what she, Brian Katie shared with this lady is that you don't have to recreate that traumatic experience is really happens last time, but you don't have to recreate the experience to relieve it again. You'd have a choice. And the minute she got it, she realized it, she smiled for the first time. Of course, Michael Neal says that immediately the phone keep ringing with psychologists and all that keep in some shouting at them saying that they are trying to trivialize or trying to ignore the suffering that the lady went through. It's not. It's trying to help the lady to see that she don't have to relive, to recreate. Because every time we think back, is we are recreating that traumatic experience, version two, version three, and so on. So no matter how deep you think in terms of neuron pathway and all that, just thought away, you'll be out of it. Since we are did another story, I like stories. Um, there's this uh, lady, I, I was about to sh share anyway later on, so I, I will jump. Um, there's a very famous uh, psychologist, maybe you might not have heard, but because he's, he's famous uh, because he can solve uh, people with mental problems. I think it's the same in Australia, where in America, if someone is diagnosed with a mental problem, they have no way to solve it. They only can lessen the aggression. Anyway, this guy called uh, Dr. Bill Pettit, which is a psychologist, now it's maybe 80s. Uh, he don't believe anyone is mentally broken. To him, everyone is mentally healthy. It's just their thought create a terrible world for them to live in. So he has this patient, an old lady who has been in depression for at least 20, 30 years. And he tried to explain to her what I explained to you just now. It, over three days. Uh, finally, he gave up because the lady couldn't see, couldn't realize, couldn't see what he's explaining. So he says in aspiration, he looked at the late old lady and says, no, 
Have you ever been happy any time in your life? Surprisingly, the old lady looked at him and says, yes, every morning. Every morning when I wake up, I'm very happy. Then Dr. Bill Pate asked him, then what happened? Then I started thinking all the things, all the reasons why I shouldn't be happy and I've become depressed. But the minute she said and saw it, her depression was solved forever. Just one realization. So it doesn't take a lot of time. I'm not saying that the same for everyone, but it doesn't need to be to take a lot of time. If you think that it needs a lot of time, then I'm sorry, that's the world you live in. You create your world. Okay, any other questions? I, I was like... Yes, I'm just going to stop sharing your screen if that's okay. Okay, there you are, and we can see. Yeah, I can see everyone. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Venerable, another question. How okay. do we watch these emotions? Is it like watching movie or any more tips? This is a question that came up after you led us through the meditation. How do we watch the uh, sorry? How do we watch our emotion? You're talking about in daily life. Uh, in meditation. So earlier when you gave the instruction. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. So it like watching a movie or any other tips? No, no, no. The emotions at the present. When you're doing meditation, just now when I guide you, is to feel whatever emotions you have now. Okay? Because the exercises is to bring you to be present. Okay? Only by being in present, then you're not lost in your thoughts. If you try to think of some emotion, emo then you're lost in thoughts again. Mm -hmm. The key of all med Buddhist meditation exercises, most of them, is to bring you to the present, to be here and now. Not, this is not the final aim, okay? Don't misunderstand. This is only the foundation so that you can see the reality, which the reality which I explained throughout this whole session. Thank you, Venerable. Another question. How do we change our perception on negative things like terrorists? It seems like most people have fear and hate towards them, including me. Don't try to change your perception. If you try to change your perception, means you still think that your perception is real. Try to see that all your perception are made of thoughts. Thoughts are just stories, your opinion, your beliefs. They are all stories. One day you might, today you might see terrorists as terrible. Another day you might see them, I don't know, might be loving or whatever. Because no human are actually bad. Okay? Just uh, as a sideline quickly is, when the, this is uh, what I'm sharing with you, uh, it's quite big in America, maybe in Australia also, in Europe. They call it three principle. But anyway, when they share it to the uh, prisoners, they also share it a lot to the prisoners. A lot of the prisoners' reaction, they are very touched. They say, you know, if I had known that my anger don't come from that person, it comes from my thinking, I wouldn't have killed him. And I wouldn't be in, in my jail, in the jail now. So similarly, terrorists think that other humans are a threat to them and they have to protect their right. They are doing what their thoughts think is right. They are not inherently good or bad. That's good. Thank you, Venerable. Another question. How do each of the eight factors of the path contribute towards awakening? I think this is about the noble eightfold path being the fourth of the four noble truths. Um, I can only go very quickly, okay, because this is actually noble eightfold path is the end of my thoughts, okay? I end of my uh, sharing, which uh, some, somehow we, were, we didn't get there. Um, very quickly is noble eightfold path is divided into three parts. Um, most people didn't notice it actually starts with wisdom. Mm -hmm. We always think that noble eightfold path starts with morality or discipline. No, it starts with wisdom. So first you have to have the wisdom that I shared just now, part of it, not, no, there's many other aspects, but the key important thing is the wisdom that I shared just now. Then you apply it in your speech, action, and your lifestyle, which is the second part. And the third part is, this wisdom has to become part of you. As in, 
you become the Dharma, Dharma becomes you. You live in that wisdom. That means it becomes automatic. You don't have to think, oh, okay, now I'm angry because of my angry. You don't have to think. It's, it's just part of you. So this is very quickly in summarizing the Noble Eightfold Path. Yes, thank you, Venerable. So it seems like right view starts that whole path. Right. With yeah. 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 So now normally when I do Dharma sharing, I emphasize a lot on right view. Mm. Because if your view is wrong, you can make a lot of effort, you can meditate very hard, you are going nowhere. So you have to get your view correct, then only you can start doing the rest. And in fact, it's one of the discourse the Buddha says that the Noble Eightfold Path starts, has to start with right view. Okay, I think we are almost time. One more question. Yeah. Sorry, we have one more. That's okay. okay. I, I have time. <laughs> uh, Venerable, you. is there a technical definition for this word realization? The way you describe dukkha is a very precise meaning of unsatisfactoriness. When it comes to realization versus thought, what, how would you see the difference between those two things? Uh, what, I can't get what you mean. What constitutes a realization versus a mere thought? What, what oh, is realization means um, you, you, you really see, like, for example, um, you really see that fire burns. Mm. It's not a thought that, oh, okay, a fire burn, okay, lah. but you really see. And as in, um, either through experience or through getting close to a fire or something. And then you don't have to think anymore. Mm. It's like a joke, maybe. Mm. Ah, okay. Yeah. Someone suggested, is it like a realization is a change from within? It's a change from within, definitely. Mm. Yeah, it's a transformation. Yeah, it's like when you realize that there is gravity, you will not walk at the edge of the rooftop because you know you will, you will drop down. Mm. You don't have to think. Mm. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Venerable. Um, we come to the end of this very excellent session. Only part one. The audience have requested for a part two, three, four, five, and six, and seven, if that's okay. <laughs> And so, Venerable, we've had a really amazing talk from you today with the sharing of the Dhamma. We have had an excellent discussion and I thank the audience and all the people who've asked these questions to make today so lively and importantly, something that really touches our hearts and hopefully gives us that transformation that Venerable has spoken about. So, Venerable, can we end this beautiful session today with a sharing of merits led by you? Um. I will explain in English and after that I will recite in Pali. Okay. So, um, oh, before that, uh, I would like to thank the uh, participants and all that for the good questions because it's only through your participation that makes the exploration more meaningful and uh, more useful. Okay. Um, in your mind, we share merits with all the devas, dharma protectors, guardian deities, all the heavenly beings, all family members, relative friends or especially our departed family member, relative friends and ancestors. Make aspiration always with the wise, avoid the foolish, be free from great hatred, delusion, all the way through our realization, until realization of Nibbana. And again, in the end, we share merits with each and every single being, wishing each and every single being an equal share of merits. Etawata chame yi sampadang punya sampadang sabe dewa numodan tu sabe sampati sitia etawata chame yi sampadang punya sampadang sabe buta numodan tu sabe sampati sitia etawata chame yi sampadang punya sampadang sabe sata numodan tu sabe sampati sitia dame nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo dame nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo Dame nya tinang hotu sukita hontu nya tayo imina punya kame na mame bala sama gamo satang sama gamo hotu ya wani bana patia dame punyang asawa kaya wahang hotu dame punyang ni bana sa pachayo hotu mama punya bagang saba satanang pajemi te sabe me samam punya bagang labantu 
sadu 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 thank you very much thank you venerable and venerable uh, we have a gift for you this is from somebody who is part of the audience her name is brooke and while she was listening to your talk she drew you <laughs> oh amazing <laughs> can you send it to me somehow absolutely we will brooke okay. may also some coloring in as well and then we will post this out to you <laughs> okay thank you very much thank you happy and exploring oh thank you and just uh, if people can just stay for a little bit longer we do have some announcements to make so very briefly to next wednesday we have a very interesting session we have ajahn sadaro who will be traveling to sydney from melbourne and he's usually from the buddhist society of victoria and he is actually part of um, the university of monash so monash university where he's conducting a study on meditation and its link with relationships so from 6 p.m. next Wednesday, anyone who would like to join and be a part of the study and participate in this experiment, they are welcome to come along to the um, Bankstown Western Sydney University. And that's at 6 o'clock. And I've just posted into um, on the screen for you to see. And there's the QR code if you wish to participate as well. And if you would like to participate, please send over or well, make sure you register, but also email Venerable so he's aware that you will be coming. Uh, it would be really interesting to see the results of this and you can participate in that experiment. After the 6 p.m. session at 7 to 9 p.m., we will have our regular session where you can participate online and in person. It's going to go until 9 p.m. because he's going to also talk about the study and also allow those who can't come at 6 p.m. to participate in a bit of that as well. So it's going to be a very interesting session and he will be talking about the insufficiency of intention. Very interesting. So please feel free to join. We also have, as usual, our Monday sessions and we have Jimmy who will be taking the session on Monday. And remember, this Monday, coming Monday, is a public holiday, so it will only be online. The following Monday, Jimmy will continue and it will be in person, 6.30 to 7.30. We have Tuesday yoga sessions, 6.30 to 7.30 in person at the uni. And also we are running a retreat on the 5th to the 7th of July in Blue Mountains. It's pretty full at the moment and if you would like to join you can also register finally we have a pilgrimage that we are organizing to sri lanka at the end of the year and all of the details are on our website and venerable i really hope to see you in sydney next time and if not then maybe on zoom for part two to seven <laughs> thank you again thank you everyone for participating and thank you sister sophia for the recommendation and introducing us to venerable it's been lovely Thank you.